Last time I mentioned that there were a lot of cases and situations and entirely different fields that our discussion here could easily and very helpfully apply to. And so I wanted to quickly give you some examples of these just to show you how important the stuff that we're talking about really is. One really important case is what do we do in disaster or mass casualty situations where there are a lot more patients than there are healthcare workers or first responders? How do we triage these patients? In other words, how do we determine whom we help first? Should we try to help the people that need it the most? Or should we help the people that have the best chance of survival given that we intervene? What's the most ethical approach here? And there are clear cut answers to a question like this, but we should always be ready to challenge those kinds of assumptions and make sure that we're doing the most ethical, the, the most fair way of assessing these terrible situations. Or what about results done in experiments that are, that were done like heinously, you know, very unethically, but the results could help a whole lot of people. And it's like, on the one hand, yeah, you know, we could use those results to help people. But on the other, like, are we dishonoring the memory of these people who were, you know, often tortured or, or abused in order to get these results? These, again, are, we do have clear answers to them, but, you know, we can always work to challenge this stuff and see where our, our value claims and our moral framework might take us. What about governments that institute different policies, like should the government introduce an alcohol ban, right? Alcohol kills lots of people. There was prohibition in the early 1900s and it had some pretty terrible consequences, but are governments somehow morally responsible for the introduction of these policies? And how do we go about assessing social policies that we know are going to benefit some people while harming other people? There's also just real life cases where the whole question of killing versus letting die is at the forefront. Um, we already talked about euthanasia, right? Can a doctor kill her patient who is terminally ill and is suffering, or is she morally required to let her patient die? Uh, what about abortions, especially uh, abortions or pregnancies in which the pregnant person's life is at stake? You may end up having to kill the fetus in order to save the life of the pregnant person. What is the morally permissible thing to do in a case like that? Also, as artificial intelligence technology gets more and more developed and more and more advanced, we are going to see situations where engineers are going to need to program in sort of fail safe scenarios like what's going to happen if I have to hit a person and risk killing them how is this computer going to decide what to do? And this is actually uh, the question that you'll have as your focus for the argument post for this module. The, the question of AI ends up being really, really interesting. Or what about ambiguous DNR orders? There's two really famous cases that I'm aware of. There was one from like the early 2010s where a patient came in with DNR tattooed on his chest and the doctors are like, what is this, right? So DNR is do not resuscitate. Is this an order saying that like we can't work on this patient? Like that we, you know, we ethically cannot perform life-saving interventions for this patient. They did end up going ahead and saying, you know what, this, this tattoo is ambiguous enough and it's just not clear that this is a legitimate DNR order. So they did go ahead and save the patient's life. It turned out that that tattoo was a result of the patient having lost a bet, I think a poker bet. And I mean, good on him. He followed through with the bet, like what a champ, but like what a difficult situation for the doctors and, and other related healthcare workers to have to deal with. There was another very similar situation where a patient had do not resuscitate tattooed, I want to say on his neck, and he was elderly, maybe in his 70s, and it turned out that they did honor that tattoo and then ended up finding um, paperwork that justified their decision. So he did actually have a DNR order and they were able to get both of those cases right. But these are really, really interesting and real life scenarios where it's like, what is the morally correct thing to do here? And so the thought is that 
if we can put together some kind of guiding principles, some kind of means of evaluating the moral status of these different actions, that can help us a whole lot in deciding morally correct actions in these particular cases or in these other fields. And remember, just saying, hey, this is a case of killing, there doesn't seem to be enough moral content in that for us to determine the moral status of the act. I tell you, hey, this is an act of killing. That's not enough for you to know. Is it morally permissible, impermissible, obligatory? Like what's going on here? So we need to find a principled means of figuring out what the moral status of these different actions are. That is where the first principle that we're going to look at comes in. It's called the doctrine of double effect. It has very ancient roots, but very much more modern and rigorous development. It's pretty useful, although controversial. Let's talk about it. I think the best way to understand the doctrine of double effect is as a decision procedure. Remember how an ethical theory has three parts, criterion of right, decision procedure, theory of value. So the doctrine of double effect is just this principle that can function or does function as a decision, a decision procedure, a way to decide whether or not the thing that you're about to do is morally permissible or not. And what's kind of cool about the doctrine is that any ethical theory could incorporate this as part of its broader decision procedure. That would be a nice feature that either a consequentialist, deontologist, or even a, a virtue ethicist possibly could incorporate into his or her fully fledged ethical theory. The basic idea behind the doctrine. So what's going on here is it is going to tell us what is morally permissible in cases that involve two outcomes. One, that you are like foreseeing and intending to happen that is good and then one that you know is going to happen, you wish it wouldn't, but it definitely will, and it's bad. And remember, good and bad here, we're just going to cash these out as valuable and disvaluable, respectively. So what we're talking about, an action that is going to have two distinct outcomes, not two different actions, same action, two different effects, one good, one bad. Now, technically, every action is like this every action that you engage with. You know, if you have a bunch of homework to do, but you're really sleepy, so you decide to take a nap, there's what's called an opportunity cost associated with taking that nap, right? And that you will not have as much time to finish your homework. You know, if I decide to go to the movies, that means I'm not at the park. Every decision we make is like this, but we're not talking about that kind of stuff. We are talking about very serious, life and death situations. When is it permissible to try to promote some very important good when you know that it is also going to cause some very serious harm? So this is from the SEP, the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. This is from their first paragraph. I like how the author there uh, cashes out what, what the doctrine is. So according to the principle of double effect, principle doctrine, same thing, Sometimes it is permissible to cause a harm as a side effect or double effect of bringing about a good result, even though it would not be permissible to cause such a harm as a means to bringing about the same good end. I think if you stare at this for a little bit, you can unpack this and make sense of it. You know, you've got a lot of philosophy tools. Don't, you know, put yourself down or doubt yourself just because something seems a little bit thick at first. You know, it's philosophy. It's never going to be easy. It's never going to be straightforward. But the basic idea here is that there are sometimes going to be cases where I can cause a good thing to happen that will also cause a bad thing to happen. And that's okay. Even if it wouldn't be okay for me to cause the bad thing to happen, which would then cause the good thing to happen. This is a little bit tricky to follow, I know. Um, I've got a couple of criteria for the kinds of cases that we're gonna look at and some examples here. Now this slide has four different criteria for when this kind of thing is morally permissible. So again, when is it permissible to let something bad happen 
while you are trying to cause something good to happen. So your actions are going to cause the bad thing. They're also going to cause the good thing. It's the good thing that you're aiming for, but the bad thing is just going to be this unavoidable result. Um, I have these on one side, but we're going to kind of take these two or each of these in turn. Now, the first two, I think, are the most important. I think the other two parts of this, the other two criteria, kind of fall out of or are kind of implied by these first two. So I think if you get your head around these first two, you'll be okay. So the first one just says that the act itself must be morally good or at least indifferent. So what we're talking about here, remember, good means valuable. So once we take into account all of the morally relevant features here, it will have either all things considered positive value or to at least have zero value, like neg negligible value. It would not have negative value. So, you know, you've killed somebody, but you've also like saved five other people in doing so. And like, yeah, this death is a bad thing, but maybe it's outweighed by all of these other lives. That's the general idea. Also, the agent, so you, you may not positively will the bad effect, but you may permit it. If you can attain the good effect without the bad effect, you should do so. The bad effect is sometimes said to be indirectly voluntary. So the idea here is that the thing that you want to happen when you do this action is the good effect. You want that positive effect to happen. That's what you're trying to do. You cannot want the bad effect to happen. You just sort of recognize that it is going to happen. We call it an indirectly voluntary action because you're still voluntarily doing something. So, um, I mean, as a, as a, this isn't a great example, but let's say there's two people, they're hanging on a cliff and you only have time to save one of them. So you, you know, you just run over and save the person on the right. What is your intent here? It's to save that person on the right, but you fully recognize that that person on the left is going to, you know, lose their grip and, and drop. Like it is something that you foresee. You don't want it to happen. You're not willing it to happen. But notice by voluntarily choosing to save the guy on the right, you are also in a sense intending for the person on the left to fall right? Like you made an intentional action. You don't want it to happen, but it is fully foreseeable that it is going to happen as a result of your choice. That's the general idea of what we're talking about here. A lot of authors use the terms direct and oblique intention when they're talking about the doctrine. I'm going to follow suit and use those terms as well. So again, in our case of the two people on the cliff, your direct intention is to save the guy on the right, to grab him, pull him up. Your oblique intention is to allow the guy on the left to fall and, you know, get hurt or die or whatever. That is what's going on here. Do you want that to happen? I mean, no. And if there was a way to avoid it, you would. That's the other big part of this, right? If you can get the good effect without the bad one, you should. So if you have like maybe a long pole and you could hold it out so that they could both grab onto it, then yeah, do that instead. So we're looking at cases where you are aiming at the good thing, but you fully recognize that the bad thing would happen. And the bad thing is just kind of an unavoidable consequence of the action that you're taking. Now, principle three is basically just saying that you can't aim at the good effect through the bad effect. So in the example actually that I gave earlier, I can't or um, I can't necessarily like kill somebody just directly in order to like just save five other people like that kind of intervention isn't always going to be permissible. It does depend on the details a little bit here. But the basic idea is I can't just cause the bad effect to happen and then realize that the good effect will happen down this chain of causation. That's not how that works because now my direct intention is to do the bad thing and I'm just sort of foreseeing that the good thing is going to happen. And finally, 
the good effect has to outweigh the bad effect. This, this kind of follows directly from that first principle where all of the, the, the all things considered value of the act has to be overall good or at least like neutral. So that's what's going on in the doctrine of double effect. This is a pretty rigorous decision procedure. Um, it's used in a lot of like religious doctrine, especially in uh, Catholic doctrine. The doctrine of double effect is actually at the core of what's going on when um, Catholics say that abortion is morally permissible, or sorry, morally impermissible, so morally wrong, even if it's to save the life of the mother. And you get some, some tricky cases involved there, but this is what's going on. It traces all the way back to St. Thomas Aquinas uh, in like the 1200s. He didn't call it that. And he was actually, I'm pretty sure he was just talking about like when is self-defense morally permissible? but it's been developed and refined over these centuries into the version that we see today. So those are the four criteria. And again, the basic idea here, as long as you're aiming at the good effect, that your direct intention is the good effect, and that you are not trying to bring it about by aiming at the bad effect, so as long as that happens and the good effect outweighs the bad effect, then your action should, in general, be morally uh, permissible according to the doctrine. Here are some examples. So this first one we've got a case of maybe two countries at war and there is a weapons facility like you know a place that manufactures weapons of war and we have the opportunity to bomb that weapons facility and blow it up. But around the weapons facility are houses. Maybe they're the people who work there. Maybe actually it's a little bit better um, if they're just, maybe they just built this weapons facility in the middle of a populated area. You know, maybe thinking, oh, well, people won't bomb this because they don't want to kill innocent civilians. So that's our scenario. Weapons facility, innocent civilians surrounding it. We want to bomb the weapons facility. We want to blow it up. But we fully recognize that, you know, given the way explosions work, a whole bunch of people around that weapons facility are going to be injured or killed. So can we do this? This scenario is what's often called a strategic bombing when you're talking about the doctrine of double effect. And according to the doctrine, this bombing is permissible. So let's run it through our four criteria. So bombing the facility. Is it morally good? I mean, yeah, I, it's at least morally neutral, right? Like you are trying to put an early end to a war. You're trying to stop this other country's capabilities of producing weapons of war, which in turn would kill a lot more people. So at the very least, it does seem to meet that first criterion of being at least morally neutral, if not morally good. What is your direct intention here? What is the thing that you're trying to do? Well, you're trying to blow up the weapons facility. What is your oblique intention? What is the thing that you see that will happen as a result? Well, all of these civilians are going to die or get you know, seriously hurt. So our second criterion, we can check that off. Our direct intention is the good thing, blowing up the weapons facility. Our oblique intention is the bad thing. And let me be clear, like when you drop a bomb on a weapons facility and you know full well that that explosion is gonna kill these surrounding people, there is a, a very real sense in which you are intending their deaths. It's just that it's unavoidable. You know, the thing that you want to have happen, the good effect is just going to lead to this and there's just nothing that you can really do about it. That's what we mean by unavoidable. Okay, so the civilian deaths are unavoidable, so criterion three is checked off. And it seems as though, you know, depending on how you want to like run the math here, depending on your ethical commitments, blowing up the weapons facility would save a lot more lives like in the, in the near and long-term future than would be lost by the civilians surrounding that weapons facility. It could bring the war to an early end. And so it seems like that goal does outweigh the negative of, you know, these civilian deaths. If you compare this to someone like a terrorist bomber, same scenario, but in this case, the bomber is going to blow up a weapons facility 
in order to kill and injure the civilians around it. Their direct intention is now to kill people, right? It's not necessarily to blow up the weapons facility. The weapons facility is actually just a really good way to make a massive, massive explosion, which will make their bomb more effective. So we can, I mean, these on the surface could be very, very similar, but it's our agents' intentions, their direct and oblique intentions, that determine the moral status of the act itself. So what are you trying to do here? What about general cases of abortion? So I've got a case here that would be permissible under the doctrine. So you're a doctor, your patient has uterine cancer of some sort, and the, the, the way that you're going to get at to remove the cancer would be to perform a hysterectomy to remove the patient's uterus, but the patient is pregnant. So can we do this? Well, according to the doctrine, my direct intention in this case is to remove that uterus, to remove the cancer. I also fully recognize, though, that in doing that, the fetus will die, right? So my, my actions will have a result that will end up in the death of the fetus. But again, my direct intention is to save the pregnant person's life. And in this particular case, the oblique intention is that this fetus will die. Now, if we're just talking about, you know, an abortion that is not medically necessary, there's no way. Your direct intention in that case is to kill the fetus. That is what you are doing when you are performing an abortion. And so, and I'm not saying that abortion is immoral or impermissible or anything. I'm saying that according to the doctrine of double effect, this is the result that you're going to get. There's no way to just perform an abortion in order to save somebody's life even, because even in that case, even if the fetus, uh, if carried to term, could kill the pregnant person, what is my direct intent? Well, when I perform an abortion, the thing that I am doing is killing the fetus. And I recognize that as a result of that, that I will be saving the pregnant person's life, but I'm not allowed to do that. I'm not allowed to directly intend the bad effect. I have to directly intend the good effect. And there's just no way around it. You know, you can't talk yourself out of that situation. There's an interesting little hiccup here when it comes to ectopic pregnancies. So these are pregnancies that happen outside of the uterus. And most of the time when an ectopic pregnancy occurs, it occurs in the fallopian tube. And this is absolutely like fatal. Um, in I think, if not every case, then the vast, vast majority of them, if left untreated, um, this will result in death. It's really interesting because according to this doctrine, you can't chemically abort the fetus. You're not allowed to do that. So if you catch it early enough, there are certain medications that you can give that the fetus will absorb and then just be passed out. But you're not allowed to do that according to the doctrine because now your direct intent is to kill the fetus. If instead you cut the fallopian tube out at the part where the fetus is attached and removed it, then that is permissible. And I'll be honest, like this seems very hand wavy to me. I don't know if like, for example, suppose that there's an ectopic pregnancy, fetus is attached to the fallopian tube. I don't want to violate the doctrine of double effect. And so I could give the pregnant person the medication, but I'm like, I don't want to violate the doctrine. So I don't want to give you that medication. So instead I'll just remove your fallopian tube. That seems to be a way to work around this issue. And I'm not quite sure what the doctrine would say about a case like that. I don't know. In other words, I don't know if the fallopian tube removal has to be medically necessary or not. I do know that for the case of the uterus, right? I can't just, as a doctor, I can't just remove the uterus of a healthy female, even with her consent, um, because she doesn't want to be pregnant and doesn't want to violate the doctrine of double effect. That doesn't work. The, the hysterectomy does need to be medically necessary in order to not violate that doctrine. 
What about self-defense? This is an interesting case because this is a case where like, if somebody, you know, breaks into your house and you, and you kill them in self-defense, it's, it almost seems like, aren't I directly intending their death? Isn't that what's happening here? If I aim a gun and I shoot at somebody and they die, aren't I literally aiming at the bad outcome in that kind of case? But what's really kind of going on here, and this is a little bit tricky, but the way that we can cash this out is that your direct intent here is it's not necessarily to kill the attacker it's to stop them right it's to stop this attack from happening or continuing and if the attacker dies as a result i mean that is very unfortunate but you didn't intend on that happening it's not as if you're going to you know shoot the attacker and um, if they're wounded, but they're stopped, you're not just going to go over and like double tap them, right? Like and, and finish the job. That's not going to happen. That's not, at least it's not going to be permissible according to the doctrine. And then on the flip side here, I mean, you also couldn't, for example, put a whole bunch of like money and drugs in plain view of a window with the curtains up so that people outside can see while you sit inside with a shotgun and just wait until somebody breaks into your house and then you're finally like, ah, finally I get a chance to like kill somebody illegally. Like, no, no, no. Your direct intent in that case is to kill somebody, right? Like that's what's happening in that kind of case. So the doctrine of double effect is a pretty nice, pretty rigorous way of handling a lot of these different kinds of cases. It will, for a lot of people, get the abortion question wrong because abortion is almost never morally permissible according to the doctrine of double effect. And so a lot of people are gonna say, nope, the doctrine doesn't work because of that. You can try to limit it in certain ways, but like as it stands, this is what the doctrine says. So that is something to be aware of. But if we go back and we apply it to that question that we initially started with, we can start to identify some morally relevant features of those cases. You know, we can, we can say why they might be equally bad. Uh, consider the, what was it, Bob and, and I can't remember the other guy's name, Arnold or something, who they both wanted their nephews dead, right? Both of them, in a, in a real sense, had a direct intention of having their nephews die. They had their direct intention on this bad thing. We can identify that and then talk about like, okay, well, there's a morally relevant feature. And in neither case is it outweighed by anything good. You know, they might get an inheritance or something that they, you know, don't morally deserve, but that doesn't seem to outweigh the death of the kid. We can actually go back and apply this doctrine to a lot of the cases that we've talked about in some pretty interesting ways. So even though you might not like some of the results that it gets, and that's totally okay, as a general decision procedure, it can be useful for this killing versus letting die question that we're talking about. Now we will see some cases where maybe the doctrine starts to have trouble um, and just maybe how the general principle is applied. And we're gonna start talking about that in the next video when we talk about Philippa Foote and her super duper famous trolley problem. Definitely the most fun part of this module to, to think about and argue about. I'll see you then.